So most pastoralists, livestock herding populations uh, reside on communally managed land and they haven't historically had, um, well, they certainly haven't had private rights to the land. And in most cases, in Kenya, the land is actually owned by the government. And in, in the late 70s, the government started to uh, have a process of land adjudication where they were establishing property rights in land. In the farming areas of Kenya, this was private property ownership. In the pastoral areas where they were starting to do this, they were doing group ownership. That was the model. So, because you need a lot of land for these pastoral systems. But what, what I found out was there was one community in Samburu um, district where they had actually privatized into individual plots. So most people who study pastoralists say, if you privatize like that, you're gonna destroy the system because you won't have access to enough land for grazing if people have individual pieces. So what I did was compared two communities, this one where they privatized and another one where they have the group tenure, so it's basically still communal. And I compared their household level well-being uh, after privatization. So in this case, people didn't lose access to land. They still had land. And for the most part, even these individual pieces that they had, which were fairly small, 23 acres, is not very big for a pastoralist. But they, people generally were not fencing them and they weren't preventing people from coming onto that land. So they could still graze uh, and they still were grazing their livestock on this land. Second, they had access to land outside their area. They could go into a government forest, they could go into neighboring group ranches, they could go down this escarpment. Uh, there were some disadvantages to those other areas, but they were options for them. So they had access to land that way. Third factor was diversification of the economy. So what I found was after privatization, the number of people growing crops in this area increased quite a bit. So they started growing maize, corn, and beans, and a few other crops on their private land, uh, which they were able to do more easily because they now had property rights. Whereas in the past, the community actually did not, was against farming. They didn't favor it. So people got a little extra food and income from the crops. And I think that this, this helped them. Uh, they also had slightly higher education levels than my other community. And uh, I think that also was, was helpful. So some people had employment outside uh, that they could get because of income. So there are a number of reasons for that. There's a lot of debate worldwide about the, about the importance of secure property rights. And there have been a lot of initiatives in African countries, especially to try to formalize property rights uh, uh, in the belief that if people have more secure and more individualized rights, they're going to do better economically. Uh, I would say uh, that's too simplistic and uh, it's not always going to be a positive outcome. So I think the value of this sort of anthropological approach focused on household level, wealth, income, and other indicators uh, helps us actually understand what happens in a particular case. So you, I can't generalize my findings to the world because there are too many specific details. But what we see if we look at several studies of the similar processes across different communities, we will see some patterns, uh, like the diversification pattern. Um, so I think that the real lesson is actually go on the ground and try to find out what's happening rather than just relying on our kind of academic models.